Murphy with Sandra Pay and your friendly neighborhood head and a board member. Um, happy to um, invite Donnie, Lori, and Sean here to open our first ever FinTech Masterclass. So we're excited to um, get started with this and hopefully we'll have some lively conversation here. The idea is that we will, in Act One first, dispel some of the misconceptions around payments in hospitality. They will be closely followed by another session that will address the vision of the customer experience with payments in hospitality in conjunction with our AHLA partners. And finally, Act Three will examine the roadmap with the hurdles and potential solutions for payments and realizing our vision overall. So with that, I hand it over to you. Um, I will get that for you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. So as soon as Lisa gets me a clicker, we can move on. But, <laughs> um, but just to kind of uh, open up on, on the setup and the format that we're going through here, um, basically, we came up with what we felt were some of the myths about payments and how that either is still true or not. Thank you. And how we can, um, in the next two that follow us, um, they will take this storyline into their portion of the master classes. So we will go from there. Um, I think if we should start real quick with introductions, Sean, you want to? Sure. Hi. Uh, Sean Nygren. I am the Senior Director over Distribution Solutions at Hilton. And my name is Donnie Schumann. Um, I am Director of Travel Partnerships at Uplift. For those of you who are unfamiliar at Up Up Uplift, we are a fintech company that specializes in buy now, pay later for travel. And Laurie Gablehouse. I'm the Head of Global um, Travel Solutions at Worldline, um, helping manage some of the bridging or the glue between our product and how that is delivered to our customers. And then some days are better than others. Just be honest. <laughs> All right, so we're going to let Sean do the introduction of the myth, and then Donnie and I are going to put in our two cents, and then you can decide if it's busted or not. Sure. Uh, so for above property, only non-refundable rates can be collected. Well, I'll jump in with uh, an OTA hat on. I used to work at Hotel Tonight and Airbnb, and then also an alternative payment method hat on. Um, I would argue that this is a myth. Um, I really think that this is not a technical limitation. It's more attributed to rate policy. Um, and speaking particularly for alternative payment methods, um, we work with different hotels um, where when we pass the payment method to them, uh, regardless of what rate policy it is, they can set up mechanisms with their on-property staff um, or with their night audit to basically charge our virtual cards in full um, within 24 hours of booking. That requires obviously some extra manual work, um, but it's not necessarily impossible. Yeah, and I, I would say as well from the, the technical side or the processing side of collecting uh, the rates, we're beholding to what the hoteliers decide should be pre-collected or above property versus what they prefer to do at the property. And there, there are advantages, I think, to anything you can do in advance of the guest arriving on your property to ensure that what um, is owed through either a virtual card or any kind of other payment um, if you've gotten that out of the way, then the simplicity of their check-in, either through your mobile app or um, once they walk through the door and hit the front desk, some of that can be simplified and more efficient. Yeah, and I would agree. Um, we, uh, we see, for example, uh, cash deposits or, or collecting the deposit ahead of time has been done for a long, long time. So I'm not even sure why this was even a, a consideration, I guess, because hotels have been collecting payment um, prior for, for years. So, But the cancellation policy is probably one of the drivers of, right. of exactly. whether or not they yeah. do or they don't. And that is kind of a policy-driven process. Yeah. All right. Are you going to so, Well, yeah. So, 
Bust. All right. Nice. Next, next time I'll do it better. All right. All right. We're, we're working on this. We've got to keep it lively. It's the afternoon We should have built it into the deck. But all right. Um, at the property level, I don't know when the form of payment is a virtual credit card. So this one could be controversial, but I would argue that this is a fact. Um, and uh, one stat I can point to, I actually heard during one of the Hedna payment working group calls, um, was a stat from MasterCard that VCC breakage is around 30%. Um, and I can speak you know, from my past OTA days. Um, I remember some small brands in the US that within a year could rack up a couple million dollars in uncharged VCCs. Um, and you know, that contributes to, I think, two main issues for the hotel. One is money potentially left on the table. Um, and two, a poor guest check-in experience because maybe they paid one way or thought they paid one way, um, but then when they arrive on property, um, they find out otherwise. Um, and you know, I think that really comes down to the fact that there are CRS you know, virtual card indicators, but is it being passed down to the PMS correctly? And is all the information there so that the VCC gets handled in the right way? Lori, your thoughts? Yeah. So I would say this is probably from our, our hoteliers one of the greatest pain points that they feel like they face today next to chargebacks. So, you know, pick your poison. But um, I would agree that on some level, virtual cards are a bit of an unknown factor depending on who issued them. There are many large OTAs that have figured out some ways of flagging that, whether that's in comments or uh, some information that comes with the rate or the type of rate. But it is, it is a bit of the Wild West, I think, on some level, depending on the hotelier and the OTA that is sending down the cards or the product that is creating the issuance of the card. And I do believe moving forward at an industry level, this is the one thing we should be able to attack. But to your point, the, the tagging of it is maybe not enough because there are grander instructions around, is it room and tax? Is it room tax plus something? Um, did they even calculate that correctly at the OTA? Because if you at the property level believe you're owed 1,002, but the card was issued for 1,000, it will not approve. And then you don't know why. So that is kind of that level of lack of information that doesn't allow you to react appropriately to, to accepting the card. And currency, even oh, too. Currency. What currency to charge the card? Yes, currency, oh joy. I think that's a different question. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I, you know, I agree with that. I, I think when I saw this question, I, I was torn because we've been processing virtual credit cards for our OTA partners for years, and our hotels are, are pretty good at identifying those those bookings coming in, but it's a negotiated rate, so they know uh, what the rules are, are around that rate. It's really when when a virtual credit card is being used on a public rate, mm -hmm. they have no idea. Yeah. Now we've gone and added virtual credit card indicator on in the APIs, but we haven't gotten to the point where it's being passed down to the CRS yet or being passed down to the property yet. So they are not doing anything with the indicator, but we're making headway. It's one of those things where we've been, we were kind of waiting for someone to tell us, this is how you're going to do this, mm. and it never came. So we just kind of made it up, and now we've got it in our APIs, but it only goes that far. So we still have a lot of work to do. And in all fairness to the industry, um, to HD&G many years ago, there is a, a, a tag for it. And I think also in the OPA, the Open Payment Alliance uh, framework that we published during COVID, because you know we were home, we could stare at specifications. Um, that flagging, that is all possible, but I think also with the new framework that we published during COVID, there's a little more leeway in sorting out some of the instructions that should go with that card to the property, so. Right. and and. When you start getting into the virtual credit cards, to your point earlier, is it room and tax? Is mm -hmm. it room tax and parking? Or is it, you know, what is ever covered? So yeah. is one code enough? Right. Yeah, and I think speaking back to the guest experience part, we can put comments in the PMS, but then it also comes down to training the staff on property to identify that, right? Yeah. Um, if we don't have a singular identifier, that makes it easy to see that a virtual credit card right. was used. Yeah. 
I can also, you know, kind of speak to the fact that we did a, a proof of concept of this just prior to COVID with a property in Singapore where um, the card from the OTA was picked up by the CRS and it was stored in a way that um, we knew obviously what it was and what it was for. And when, the, when everything worked, they were very excited about it. But the second something didn't work, and I will tell you that one of the things that didn't work was that calculation of the taxes. That if that wasn't picked up as something that should be collected when the card was processed, then all you got was room. And a month later, when somebody at the hotel was auditing, they're like, what happened to all my tax money? Eh, that's a bit of a problem. So, you know, one and done on those cards. Payments are guest centric. Um, I would say this is a myth, even though we would all love for that to be a fact, um, at least from a direct booking standpoint. But I mean, I think the issue that puts a spotlight on this are, is cross-border transactions, um, right? If you're a hotel in Germany trying to sell to an American traveler, you're going to be selling in the currency that you process on property. Um, but how are you displaying that currency to the end user in America who's doing the conversion, who's taking on the FX fees, um, is the hotel bearing it, is the guest bearing it? Um, so I think until we get to a world where we're truly processing above property, to your points, Lori, um, it'll be uh, a little bit longer until we get to a truly guest-centric world for at least direct bookings, I think. Yeah, and, and to give a little history, Hedna, uh, many years ago, we put together um, some working groups, and one of them was this guest-centric one that I helped co-chair with a couple of different hoteliers. But the idea being that guest-centric means that you are providing the payments of choice in the right currency, the right choices to the guests, not only at the point where they're on your website and checking out, but how do you carry that through to the property? So does a Chinese traveler get to pay with Alipay, and then when they show up at the property in London, uh, no, they just get cards or some other options. So guest-centric terminology was really born out of that concept of how do you carry throughout the entire journey of shopping, buying, and staying um, that whole idea about how the guest wants to pay. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree it's busted. I mean... Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the hotel is collecting the point of sale. They're responsible for the taxes and mm -hmm. filing the taxes and whatnot. So it's not, at least in our environment, it's very, it would be really difficult to try to take that all above property and still be able to account for the, those. Um, if, if I, there, I know there's, there's other solutions, but at this point, that's why it's, it's more hotel-centric and not guest-centric, so. That's a tough one. If you want to talk about systems and things, this is the why we started on it many years ago. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, number four, direct booking payments options are competitive. I would also have to chime in and say I think this is a myth, <laughs> uh, at least from the alternative payment options front. I mean, if you look at one of the world's largest OTAs, um, they have a payments team of over 400 people. They're constantly testing new payment methods, offering things like buy now, pay later, like Google Wallet, Apple Pay. And it's clear in a lot of data that that helps drive more conversion um, and attract travelers who are looking for more flexible payment options. And so the reality is, um, one of the questions I like to ask at conferences is usually like, hey, by a show of hands, how many of you are offering buy now, pay later? And usually everyone just looks back blankly and I'm like, trick question, you all are, because Booking and Expedia are offering it, right? So when it comes to these alternative payment methods, um, always keep in mind, you know, are you giving an excuse for someone to book on an OTA because you're not offering the payment method that that guest is seeking to book in? Yeah, and I, I kind of go back to the, the industry process that we did create with the Open Payment Alliance in terms of the framework that we put together, the design of that, that specification was to create flexibility. Because none of us, oh, I don't know, maybe you have a crystal ball, but mine's kind of fuzzy. Um, I think is, it's a struggle to be predictive of what is the right payment method, I don't know, five years from now. You know, what we can say is that the demographics of the guests are changing. They're 
more digital. I think that was very, you know, in the Agoda presentation, that was a very good way to, to look at the future. Are you investing in your desktop applications? Probably not. I don't know why. You know, you're looking at what is the future. Well, the future is all mobile. They're not looking to, to manage things in the way we might traditionally be accustomed to. And to the point of that, how do you make payment options from that? mobile application, how do you digitize that delivery, and then, you know, that way you can compete if you need to. Now, maybe you don't. That's a whole other question. But at least you might have some flexibility by using that framework or using a similar one that allows you to deliver payment options that allow a guest to stick with you. Because they're not, I would also say one of the things we saw, I think, earlier also from one of the surveys was you know, the next generation is more price sensitive. So how are you delivering on that? You know, if they're price sensitive and they're not loyalists, you know, there's something about the payment options, which again, at the Agoda data promoted, there's a lot of payment options in Asia. So if you want to be a part of that, do you actually want to be the one offering that? Or is that an area where you should you know, have uh, some frenemies, I would say. Yeah, building upon that, I think it's, you know, who's your target audience or who are you trying to attract? As Tarek mentioned, you know, it's so fragmented in Asia, but if you're trying to target a specific audience, you know, maybe focus on those one or two payment options. Or mm -hmm. if it's Gen Z and millennials, is it digital wallets? Is it buy now, pay later? Right. Um, there's different ways you can approach it without having to address it all. And I think, Sean, this is probably one where we were. Yeah, I think it's busted. It's, we think it's kind of busted. Yeah, I, I know it is for us anyway. Um, I think that COVID had really put a, uh, kind of delayed us from going to market with some of the things that we had planned. Um, so we're, we're still trying to catch up on some of those, uh, those initiatives that we had started years ago, and we're still not quite where we want to be, and the payments, alternative payments is one of those areas. Uh, we are just now looking at piloting uh, Apple Pay and Google Wallet. We're, we're at two hotels right now, so mm -hmm. it's been a slow road, and I think you know, having to let go so many people, start all over again, reprioritize all your IT initiatives, payment was one of those things where we knew it was important, but how is how much more important is it than other things? So, yeah. it's just now being readdressed. So it's for, for us, it's definitely busted. Yeah. Okay. All right. so myth number five: uh, the guest payment experience is centered around the checkout page at booking. I would also argue that this is a myth. Um, so one interesting thing I learned after kind of getting more in the payment space from the OTA side was payments is so much more than just an option at checkout. It can actually be leveraged as a super effective and highly effective marketing tool, um, especially if you make awareness of it available upfront in the booking experience. So you know whether it's being able to promote that you're offering digital wallet or from what we see in buy now, pay later, um, you're able to market a trip entirely different um, in terms of uh, pricing. So instead of saying, hey, this trip is $2,500 a month, you can actually begin to advertise it as, hey, get on your dream vacation from as low as $120 a month. Um, so the big thing to think there is, is that if you're making this awareness available up funnel, you can drive users further down into the conversion uh, phase at time of booking um, and be able to you know, see higher order values, see higher conversion, um, and be able to give them the experience that they sought out when they uh, were looking for that payment option. Yeah, I think this goes back to, um, you know, when you're looking, you know, we, we, we get a lot of feedback as well from our customers about, you know, in, in some ways, and especially on the airline side, you'll hear, well, our planes are full. I don't know that I need better optimization of conversion, but my, I'm worried about cost. You know, I'm really focused on the cost of acceptance. And, you know, it, it, in some degree, that's also true to hoteliers, but if you're only focused on that one moment in time, are they leaving and opting out because they didn't see something? Because how did, what was the cost of your acquisition of getting them that far? Did you factor that into 
your cost because that should have been part of what you were thinking about. You know, did you do something up front from marketing dollars perspective that got somebody that far? And then what did you do to hang on to them? So leaving them at checkout with just a bunch of stuff and not necessarily the right currency so they understand what they're going to pay, the right choices so they know how they're going to pay, those are all parts of what we've always up till now kind of focused at in terms of a user experience. But I, I would say one of the, maybe the greatest gifts of COVID, there's, there's a couple actually, believe it or not, but a better focus on a payment experience and not just a user experience. I think that is something that really has changed dramatically where various hoteliers are setting up teams like you have that are focused on payment. And the fact that they actually have people whose job it is to make sure that there are KPIs around payment and it's probably not just the treasury people. <laughs> There's actually people from your revenue, you know, the revenue side and the technology side is generally the glue that keeps it all together. So having, you know, more than one voice managing those directions and choices I think the payment experience is a, is a, plays a bigger role. Yes, and I think also, too, uh, the experience at check-in, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to remove friction and being able to also interact with the guest more, um, if you can move to more towards above property collecting, too. Yeah. So think? is it busted? Oh, come on, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get you a soundboard. <laughs> right. yeah, I mean, yeah, and again, I, I am not the... Um, Payment guy, we do have a payment team. Yeah. I'm not that guy. Right. Um, we have a, a UI team that does all of our direct uh, web design and the, the whole team that does that. I'm not a part of that either. So, um, so when we were talking about this yesterday, it was a completely different perspective that I hadn't even thought about. I, um, I think from what I've heard, what we're trying to do is making it as seamless as possible, remove the whole pain and remove all the friction from the payment and so that that experience isn't even an experience. It's just mm -hmm. like automatic. So, um, but we're, we're still a ways away from that, so. Yeah, and I do think that's why a structure or a, a group of people in any large organization that get together and talk about that strategy, that's an important factor moving forward. Yeah. Okay. We have extra time if we have questions or not. No. Lisa, dear? No. Nope. Lisa, <laughs> we do not. No. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having thank me up you. here. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Edna. Thank you.